Really glad you guys are here. We're starting a new series. It's going to be this week and next week, and it's based on something that we do every single week. If you've been coming to Hub City, you know that after the sermon, we always respond in a certain way. And how do we respond? Communion, right? We, we take a piece of bread, and we dip it in the juice, and we remember what Jesus has done for us. Well, um, a little while ago, I was listening to one of my digital and print mentors, John Mark Comer, give a lecture on communion, and some lights went on for me. It was fascinating what he was sharing about communion, and I want to take his outline and some of his content and share it with you. There are certain times that I learn something, and I'm like, oh, this is cool. There are other times I learn something, and I'm like, I can't wait to share it with our Hub City Church family. This is one of those times, because I think what we're going to discover is that in this act of communion, we get a microcosm of what our lives should be like in Jesus, how we should relate to one another, how we should relate to God. Like our entire theology is wrapped up in this little microcosm of communion. And so I want us to talk about that. And what I discovered is that my understanding and probably your understanding of communion is sort of partial. Like we only know a part of of it. And there's so much more to this sacrament that we need to talk about. The communion, it really is a sacrament. I read this definition for a sacrament that I loved. I wanted to share with you guys. It's a thing of mysterious and sacred significance. It's a thing of serious and sacred or mysterious and sacred significance. Significance. And yes, it's a part of our worship, but for many of us, this thing that we do every week, it has deep meaning, right? Like it's something that, that matters to us. We miss it when we don't do it because it's this holy moment that we set aside to remember the tangible and tactile way that Jesus gave his life for us and what he's done. But so much of our understanding of this, I think, is limited. So for the next two weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of examine communion because there's more to communion than just communion. In fact, communion is sort of like a diamond. I don't know if you... Uh, um, if, you know, if you're a dude and you bought a diamond for somebody at one time, what the salesperson told you. But I remember what the salesperson told me in Seneca, South Carolina, at um, jail, uh, Zales Jewelers, while I was buying um, Liz's Diamond Wave Zale. What is it called? Zales, isn't that what it's, that's what I thought. So um, where, when I bought Liz's Diamond, he said that diamonds are like, if you look at them from different angles, you get a different perspective of the beauty of the diamond which some of you are going to be like, let me see. Uh, but, you know, it's, oh, it's glass. Oops. Uh, but, um, but that's kind of what communion is. When we look at it from these different angles, we can get a different insight into its beauty and, and a different understanding of what this mysterious and sacred sacrament is all about. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at communion from the five different names that it's called in the New Testament. I don't know if you realize that or not, but communion is called five different things throughout the New Testament. And here's what those names are. Um, I, I skipped this one. You can go on to the next one. It's communion, the breaking of bread, the Eucharist, the agape or love feast. That one should be fun, you know, sounds a little inappropriate, but... Um, and then the Lord's Supper. When you look through the New Testament, you see that this thing that we call communion is called by these five different names. And each of these names allows us to see this sacrament from a different angle and can give us a greater appreciation and understanding of what it is that we do each and every week. And not only that, it can give us a greater insight and understanding about how we are to live as followers of Jesus. Because like I said, this sacrament of communion is just a microcosm of all of what we believe as followers of Jesus. So here's what we're going to do. This week I'm going to give you an intro, kind of an intro behind this sacrament, and then we're going to look at the first three names. Next week we're going to look at the last two names, and we're going to talk about what it means for us as a church family. But I want to begin by giving us some context, because Jesus is the one who kind of instituted this sacrament. Jesus is the one who shared this first with the disciples. And we're going to look at Luke's account in Luke chapter 22. And um, so let's just read the whole story here. It says this, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He goes on. 
He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water. I love the instructions Jesus gives sometimes. I mean, basically he tells them to stalk this guy. But as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. Just these great detailed instructions. But would you want to be Peter and John and risk this? Probably not. But they do what they say. And it goes on. So they left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I want you just to think about that. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. Do you realize that that wasn't just true for the disciples back then? That today Jesus eagerly desires to meet with you and me on a regular basis. That's why in Revelation he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and anybody who invites me in, I'll come in and I'll eat with them, and they will eat with me. Jesus is like inviting us to this amazing feast on a regular basis. He's eager to do this with you. That's beside the point. Verse 16. Um, but I tell, no, go back one more. I, I, I skipped one. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Now you can switch. Um, verse 17. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he says this in verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. What I want us to do is I want us to focus on the phrase, do this in remembrance of me. Will you say that with me? Do this in remembrance of me. Yeah, I want to point out a couple things from that phrase for a minute. The first is the pronoun this, because there are a couple things that I don't want us to skip over. But the pronoun this that Jesus uses here is so, so important. It, it doesn't just refer to the bread and the juice. Now, I know when we think about it, we think that it refers just to the bread and the juice. That's what communion is. But when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, he's referring to the entire meal that he's celebrating with his disciples. In other words, it refers to, this refers to the time around the table in community with other followers of Jesus where Jesus himself is present and in charge. It's this meal with the followers of Jesus together where Jesus himself is present and he's in charge. See, Jesus isn't just saying to have a piece of bread and dip it in the juice and remember him. He's saying there's more to this thing that we call communion. Doing this, it refers to doing life together around the table with other disciples of Jesus where Jesus himself is present and at the center of that gathering. Like, think of it this way. Whenever you share a meal with people in your church family, you go out to dinner, you have a meal before your hub group, you have them over to your house, you go over to their house. Whenever you share a meal with someone in your church family, that is the this that Jesus is talking about. There's something meaningful and significant and important about eating together where it's not just us, but that Jesus is with us us as we do this together. Do this in remembrance of me. Whole nother perspective than just the bread and the juice, right? Let's point out another thing. That last little phrase, in remembrance of me. When we read that, in the English, it sounds like we should just think back and remember, like we remember middle school, or we remember our wedding day, or we remember something from the past, right? But this isn't just in memory of me. It has a much bigger meaning. Look at this quote from N.T. Wright. I love N.T. Wright. It's one of my favorite theologians who's alive today. He says, this term memorial does not mean merely bringing something to mind or remembering. It refers in some way to bringing that past story and the divine action of the past into the present 
such that the present audience becomes part of the story and receives the benefit from such actualization. To remember to do this in remembrance of me is to actualize that past and that future in the present. I know you read that and you're like, that is way over my head. And one thing, he's British, so everything he says sounds smarter. But um, really what he's talking about is this, that we need to think of communion as a practice where time is all mashed up together with the past and the present and the future all coming together when we partake of this sacrament. See, in this mashup of time, we look backward to Jesus, but we don't just look back to Jesus' death. We look back to his life and to his kingdom work and to his teaching and to his miracles and, yes, to his death and to his resurrection and his ascension. We look back to all of that, but we also look around us to our present, to our community, to those who are with us in our church family, those who are present with us together. And we also look forward to the future, to Jesus one day return sometime in the future. See, in this sacrament, there is the past, the present, and the future. And it's all tied up together in that phrase, in remembrance of me. It's not just remembering that Jesus died on the cross for us. It's remembering all that Jesus has done and all that he is doing. And all that he is going to do. Does that like expand your view of that? You know, this is one of those, you see that little emoji on your phone with the head blown off, right? That's just kind of what I felt like when I was hearing this the first time. That Jesus is at the center of everything. And this reminds us that all of our life revolves around him. Now we could just stop there because I think this kind of changes all of our views of communion. At least it does for me, but um, that's just the intro, because like I said, communion in the New Testament is called by five different names, and these five names help us to better understand what it actually means to do this in remembrance of me. So I want to take each of those names one at a time. We're going to start off with the one that we use every week, the word communion. Now the word communion, I don't know if you realize this or not, comes from the Greek word koinonia. Can you say that with me? Koinonia. So one more time. Koinonia. You're bilingual. Way to go. Um, but it's, it's translated in different ways in the New Testament. It's translated as communion or community or fellowship or participation or sharing in. It's, it, this, this word's all throughout the New Testament in those translations. Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 10 in this way. Look at what he says. It's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation or a koinonia in the blood of Christ. And it's not the bread that we break a participation or a koinonia in the body of Christ. You could could shift out the word participation and put in communion, like communion in the blood of Christ or communion in the body of Christ. Or you could take out the word participation and put in sharing, sharing in the blood of Christ or sharing in the body of Christ of Christ. It's this sharing that we have together. There's something together. There's something communal about this event or this sacrament that we practice every week. Paul uses this imagery, I think, intentionally to remind us that we as individuals are a part of a whole body of Christ, that we are not our own, but we are a part of a body. That's why we have one loaf right? We have this one loaf and we share it to remind us that we are a part of one body. I don't know if you realize this or not, but we purchase a one loaf and split that up for everybody as we share communion because even though we are individual parts, we are a part of one whole body. And so from this first name of communion, we remember that we are to commune right? We are to commune, we are to be in fellowship with, we are to participate with, we are to share life with Jesus, but also one another. There's a vertical part to this, but there's also a horizontal part to this. 
that, that we commune with Jesus, we commune with our church family. A lot of times when we share communion, we think it's all about just us and Jesus, which is such an American way of thinking. We think that so often it is my faith, it is my salvation, it is my church, it's this individual focus. But in communion, it's not just about communing with Jesus, it's about communing with one another where Jesus is present and at the center. Think about that. Think about when you get together with your friends from your church family for a meal. Jesus is present and should be at the center there as you commune with one another. You're communing with them and with Jesus. It's this amazing picture that Paul paints for us. Um, See, communion reminds us that we are not only to enjoy the company of Jesus and remember Jesus and his past and his present and his future but that we are to enjoy the company of one another, which is a challenge at times, right? Because you know one another. But it's this reminder that we are a part of one body. We are a part of one body. So that's the first name, communion. We commune with one another. We commune with Jesus. Look at the second name. It is the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread. This this isn't a name that we hear much anymore. We don't usually talk about the breaking of bread, but it's all over the New Testament. In fact, it's Luke's favorite name for this sacrament. Let me show you just a few examples. In Luke 22, he says, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them. And the book of Acts says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, that's the word koinonia, by the way, and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. One more verse. It says, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Now, some of you may be wondering as you read this, these verses, um, is, is, is Luke writing about communion? Or is he writing about a meal that these people are sharing together? And the answer is yes. Because in the first century, in the early church, there was no separation between communion like we practice it and the meals that they had together. In fact, their worship gatherings all happened in people's homes. And they would just gather around in some rich guy's backyard and have a big cookout. And that was the meal that they were sharing together. They were breaking bread together. There was zero difference at that time between the two. We separate the two, but they didn't do that in the early church. But I love this imagery of breaking of bread because in, in, in the first century, I sanitized my hands before I came up here, by the way. Um, in the first century, you didn't have a bread knife. You know, you know if, if you're like me and you shop at Lidl, I love the little bread knife, bread cutter thing. You put your bread in the little machine and it slices it for you. They didn't have that in their Lidls. They also did not have knives where they sliced their bread. Do you know how they dispersed bread among people at the table? They did not spit on their hands, Gary. <laughs> they would just break it. They'd break off a part, and then they'd pass it to the person next to you. They were not as concerned with germs as we are today. Um, but, but they would just break off a piece, and then they would pass it to the person next to them. And they would break off a piece, and they would pass it to the person next to them. They would take this one loaf, and from this one loaf, everyone would be fed. It was this amazing picture, not just of unity, though, This imagery reminds us that in the same way that the bread is broken, that Jesus was broken. That Jesus was torn apart on the cross for us. And that Jesus was handed to you and me so that we could receive the gift of life. See, the breaking of bread reminds us that true life comes from Jesus Specifically from Jesus' sacrifice for us. He sacrificed his life for us so that we could have eternal life. And eternal life in the New Testament, we're going to talk about this in a few couple of months. Eternal life in the New Testament isn't just life forever. It's life in the full now. It's life in the full, in the here and now. And Jesus sacrificed his life so that we could have life now. Jesus was broken for us. See, in the breaking of bread... We remember that all of our life ultimately comes through Jesus' death on the cross. And we are dependent on him for our life. Just as we are dependent on food to survive and to live, we are dependent on Jesus for all of our life. But it's not just a reminder that Jesus was broken for us. See, it's also a reminder that we as his followers should live lives of sacrifice and service for one another. 
See, we forget that a lot of times. But Jesus lived that way so that we would follow his example. And so that we're not just here to be beneficiaries of Jesus' sacrifice. But no, we are to be ones who follow his example and willingly sacrifice and serve one another. Lay down ourselves for one another. Allow ourselves to be broken for other people. See, the breaking of bread reminds us that we... As Jesus poured out his life for us, we should be pouring out our lives for one another. This is why serving your church family in one way or another is so important. It's an opportunity for you to model what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's this amazing image that we have here in the breaking of the bread. Last name that we're going to look at, which interestingly, the last name we're going to look at today is the most commonly used word for the for communion all over the world today. We don't use this word, but it's the word Eucharist. Y'all have heard that word before, especially if you grew up in a high church setting, maybe you've used that word. It comes from the Greek word Eucharisto. That sounds kind of fancy, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, say it with me. Eucharisto. That's, don't you, I mean, you know two words in a foreign language, man. You're way more advanced than most other Americans. But um, it comes from the Greek word Eucharisto, and it actually means thanksgiving or the thanksgiving meal now when we think of thanksgiving we think of the last thursday in um november two days before the clemson carolina game right that's what we that's that's what we think just making sure you guys are awake that's what we think of but in the new testament what we discover is that when they gathered together for worship and to eat together and to remember jesus and to do this in remembrance of me they started to call it something and one thing they started to call it over and over again was this thanksgiving meal let me show you a couple of instances for us the first one we already read and he took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them that's that eucharist though here's another one uh, for i received from the lord what i also passed on to you the lord jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks see very on early on in the church they started to use this name they they called communion the thanksgiving meal and the reason why they did that is because in the Eucharist or in this Thanksgiving meal, we're able to remember or it reminds us to remember how much it is that we have to be thankful for. We remember that we have, um, that all that we have is from God. It's this gift of God that nothing we have is earned, that nothing we have is deserved, that it's all a gift and we should be thankful. Now here's something I know about you. You know that you should be thankful right? You know that gratitude should be a regular part of your life. You, pray, you don't even have to be a Christian to know that being thankful is actually good for you. You should say thank you when you're growing up. You're, you do some, somebody give you something and your parents would look at you and go, what do you have to say? Thank you. You know, we know that we should be thankful, but too often in our modern world, we're too busy or too depressed or too worried or too distracted to take time to be thankful and what the Eucharist does is it recenters us. It pulls us back to what's most important, that we have so, so much to be thankful for. We're reminded as we take the bread and the juice to be thankful for all it is that God has given us. That we're thankful for Jesus, for his sacrifice, for his salvation. We're thankful for the abundant life that he gives us. We're thankful for what he did for us on the cross, but we're thankful for so much more, right? We're thankful for our church family, even those that we don't like all that much. We're thankful for the big things in life. We're thankful for the little things in life. We're thankful that God is with us even when we're going through hard times in life, when we're discouraged or depressed or worried. We can be thankful as we take the bread and the juice, as we participate in the Eucharist. It should move us to gratitude. It's the Thanksgiving meal. It's an opportunity to remind ourselves that we have so much, so much to be thankful for. So, you've got communion. This idea that we commune with Jesus, we commune with one another, that we are a part of one 
body, we share life together. You've got the breaking of bread, which reminds us that Jesus was broken for us, but not only that, that we should break ourselves for other people. And then you have the Eucharist, which is this reminder that our lives should be permeated with thanksgiving, that we should be, as followers of Jesus, the most thankful people on the planet because of what Jesus has done for us, for who he is, for what he is doing now, and for what he's going to do in the future. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll talk about the next two names next week, the love feast, which I'm excited to talk about, and, um, and the Lord's Supper. But what I, here's what I want us to do in light of this. I hope you learn some new things today. That was one of my goals because I learned some new things and I just, I love learning things. I hope you learned something new, but I would hate it. I would hate it, hate it, hate it if all you did was learn something new today and not do anything with what it is that you learned. So we're going to take some of what we learned and put it into practice as we share the do this in remembrance of me this morning. We're going we're gonna to do it similar but different. You know, if you come regularly, you know, we come down front and, and we take a piece of the bread and we dip it in the juice and we remember, right? We're going to sort of do that. But this morning, Liz and I are going to actually break off the bread and hand it to you as a reminder that we are all a part of one body. Even though we are individuals, we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. We're going to break it off for you to remind you that Jesus' body was broken for you and to encourage you to break, allow yourself to be broken for other people. And as you come forward and as you're going back, I want you just to pour out all it is, all it is that you have to be thankful for. Just be thinking as you come forward, all that you have to be thankful. Spend your time walking down front, just thanking God for for everything, from coffee to food to your salvation to your family to that difficult conversation that you're going to have to have this week. Just go through everything. You will not exhaust all that you have to be thankful for if you're intentional about this by the time we're done with this sacrament. So, got that? Here's what I want you to do. Close your eyes. Would you just say a little prayer first before you get to the thanksgiving i want you to tell god one thing that you learned this morning and and then let that lead you into gratitude just tell god thank you God, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about this sacrament, this mysterious and sacred thing that we do every week that is so much richer than I realized. My prayer right now is that you would remind us as we do this in remembrance of you that we are a part of one body and that you are here with us and that you are in charge, you are our king. As we share this together, would you remind us that you were broken for us and motivate us to allow ourselves to be broken for others? And then, God, would you just fill our hearts with gratitude? We have so much to be thankful for. Thank you for this sacrament that allows us to remember. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you guys to, Liz, Liz is making sure I, I've done it a few times, you know, if it was the first century, they wouldn't do that, you know, but um, it's funny that we can laugh because next week we're going to learn that communion was not this solemn, sacred thing in the early church, we, but we'll get there next week. Okay, I invite you guys to come and to be thankful and to remember.
Lord Jesus. Like I said, I really hope over the next two weeks that your understanding of this amazing thing that we get to do every week is expanded exponentially. This week, my encouragement is that you would remember that what we have done here isn't supposed to stay right here. It's a microcosm of how we are to live outside of this time. We are individuals who are a part of one body and each of us matters and Jesus is with us. That, that we have so much to be thankful for and that we, because Jesus has been broken for us, should intentionally look for ways to allow ourselves to be broken for those who are in our lives. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said.